most important thing is to determine whether a business is ready to start the digital transformation before we go down that journey. So how do you determine whether a business is ready? Can you, uh, can you hit me on that? No. no. Don't try. I clearly can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no? That's better, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. We'll share. Um, look, I'm going to start at, a, at an obvious place in uh, obviously being a CIO and having a background in technology. Um, if as an organisation you consider that your digital transformation is a job of the technologists or your IT department, it's going to fail. Right? Transformation has so much more to do um, with uh, you know, the structure of your organisation and the people in the organisation because quite often, let's be honest, nowadays the technology works. So uh, as you're going through those things, if there is a view that it's the purview of one department, that you need to reverse that view immediately and make it more of a business thing. Touched on a couple of other points there as well. So from, from a people point of view, that, that's the most important aspect of, of any, uh, any transformation. So the strong recommendation is that uh, you have, if not everybody, a strong cohort of digi digital natives or digitally competent people within your organization that are actually able to work in a digital way. Because again, unless you get the, the people side of that equation absolutely nailed, then you, you will not get the success from, uh, from the project. And the third one is to be absolutely clear on the structure in your business. So, you know, quite often we can get bored talking about uh, operating models in an organization, but if, if you're not actually clear on uh, how an organisation works and, and how it wants to work. So, you know, is it, is it a unified um, business? So, there's, you know, there's one way of doing things, or do you have diverse parts of your business, in which case you might need a more separated model? Uh, but again, if you don't have those design pieces in place, um, then, you, then you're not going to get um, those, those aspects of transformation you want. And the last thing around structure is also to think about the way that you work. So if you're moving, for example, to um, a more agile way of working, you actually have to structure um, your organization in a way that lends itself to the way that you work because the way you work is also a success factor in terms of, of transforming your business. And that's all I've got. Yeah, that's it for you all. So you touched on there that it can't just be that you're in one department that you need to go for transformation. So to, to all of our panelists, why do you think it's important to get buy-in and support for digital, digital transformation? So I'll, I'll, I'll start and, and hand it on. It's literally, you know, repeating what I said at the start. If if, uh, if it is seen as the purview of technology, then you are missing out a, a whole load of the other aspects um, that are needed in terms of making that uh, that transformation successful. Yeah, look, it's all about people. Um, I worked for Heineken, and obviously we make beer. And I've got digital transformation stories, but I want to start off with an example around manufacturing. There was a country I got sent to to try and figure out why after spending about 100 million euros on new breweries and new packaging lines, why product productivity was sitting at 27%. And it was people and leadership. And that's really simple. That's a beautifully designed and set up manufacturing environment with the best quality machinery and equipment in the world and it didn't work. People and leadership. And when it comes to that digital transformation where it's not so obvious in terms of necessarily, you know, things in front of you, if we don't get people on board if we start aligned to leadership at the start, and if people are not bought into the process and have that mindset and openness for it, it's never gonna work. And that's why we have the statistics. What, roughly 70, 80% of, of these fail. So in order to change that, we've got to start with people. I'll use a, a couple of examples, and I, I won't name the, the businesses because I know there's people from Mercury here in the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, there's one in, in Asia I've been involved in the last couple of years, and this is an example that didn't go quite so well. So people typically at your level, uh, they meet with um, uh, this call them this organisation GenTrack, and they set out what they wanted to achieve, what the outcomes were, and they were really detailed. 
really, really thorough and put months of work into planning for the, the digital transformation. Then they handed the work over to the people to do the work, to go and do the, the workshops and get things underway. And that's when it changed because the people who were leading the workshops weren't in those initial conversations. And so suddenly we got massive scope creep. The original uh, executive team that, oh, sorry, I'm spinning, what I mean to be spinning. It's hard and you're holding your stomach in and you're taking photos. Of them. But the, the people in the room didn't understand what the, uh, the key uh, measures of success were that had been set by the executive team. And so that was an interesting lesson. But on the other side of the scale, here in town, we're watching the Mercury transformation that's going on at the moment. And the, the people leaders that sit that sat down with us and went through all of the designing the parameters of what the, a transformation should run like, what looks like success, then sat in the workshops um, and were involved all the way through. And so that's why Touchwood project's going really, really well. So that'd be my key uh, lesson that I've learned. Thank you. I think those mics might be working now if you want to give them another go. Apparently, it'll take a couple of seconds and then we'll be okay, but the other ones will actually work. Um, so, how important is a well defined digital transformation strategy in ensuring successful implementation? And are there any key elements to that? Right. <laughs> How important is a well defined digital transformation strategy and what are the key elements? Yeah, I mean, I just want to say, you know, whilst there are cliches, whilst there are cliches like the microphone's not working, shall I just, I can project my voice. How's that? Okay. I, did, I didn't want to answer the question anyway. So. <laughs> Hello. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Um, so, whilst I will, I will always say, you know, culture beats strategy for breakfast, just using that, that cliche, so that, that, you know, the people side is, is the most important. Um, I'll, I'll go back to that, that uh, you know, point earlier. In terms of you, you have to know uh, organisationally where you want to go. You have to make sure that the, the, the business goals of where you want to go have to be linked to not only what you're doing day to day, but actually that, that hierarchy of metrics needs to flow down to everybody in the organization and, and every you know every piece of work that you're doing in the organization. So if you haven't got a true north that's based on um, what, what you want to achieve strategically over the next five years, then you're going to miss out on, on a, a whole load of things. You're quite often, especially at the moment, we're caught up in an environment where everything is about short-term thinking. And there are absolutely things that you can put in the fast lane and, uh, you know, get pipelines of work delivered. That's, that's why we do Agile. You know, we've got that three-month view and we go and do those things. But quite often we forget about what needs to be in the slow lane as well. So as an, as an organisation, strategically, you need to work out which thing goes in, in, in what lane and then be more deliberate about those long-term things and, and putting in the capabilities that you're going to need long term. So, so in Galahad, we've we're very much taken a capability view of IS, thinking what capabilities do we need um, over the next five years, and who will consume those capabilities so that we can deliver them in a in a completely composable way. Because you can't have this big big monolith at the core, and you can't have a strategy that you decided five years ago. Like what you're going to do in five years' time will be completely different to what you think at the moment. So if you break down your strategy into the capabilities that you think you're going to need and then deliver them technologically, then you have a chance that the business will actually consume those and they'll be there ready, um, ready when they're needed. Is that making any sense? Yeah, that's right? and I'm there, we go. Cool. there we go. Thank you. Um, and Melissa, you gave us a lovely example there of, of the impact you know, having, that people can have on a project success or failure. How can businesses enable their skilled talent to be as effective as possible and to play the roles that they need to play? 
So it really starts off with how engaged your employees are. And look, you, you might have heard some of the global research from Gallup. So let's look at this room, right? There's what, eight tables? So if you look at the global data, these two tables, you're super engaged. You love going to work. You're like, when you turn up, you're like, yeah, and you're putting your ideas, you're suggesting new things, you're really committed, you'll go above and beyond your job description, you love being there, and you're like, yeah, yeah, I want to support this. And you're doing everything you can to collaborate and work with other people. So we've got two tables in the room like that. So these two tables over here, so sorry, but you're the ones who, who dread going to work on a Monday morning. You spend your Sunday thinking, oh my God, and you, you start bitching and moaning about it when you're at your barbecue with your friends and family. They're all sick of you talking about how much you hate your job. And you do not want to even put any extra effort in. You turn up because you have to. So that's another two tables. And I've got, what, six left if I did my numbers right? Or approximately five. Um, the rest of you are like, yeah, it's okay. I'll turn up and I'll get paid, and that's important because I want to, you know, pay for my kids' tennis lessons and all of that sort of stuff. But if you get another opportunity, you're going to take it in a minute. This group, you need to be paid 31% more to want to leave to another job. <laughs> so if it's not that much, it's not even going to be an option for you because you can admit it. So that is the state of the global workforce, and actually New Zealand and Australia are even a bit lower. So we're sitting around about 17% of our employees are engaged. And do you know the one factor that um, makes 70% of the reason why people are engaged or not? Any ideas? Sorry? Leadership. Leadership, your immediate manager. So that goes back to, you know, if your leaders are not involved, if they're not creating that environment, you're going to be starting off from a really tough space anyway. So actually understanding how do you actually lead people in a way where they're going to be more engaged, they want to be part of the journey, because otherwise you're starting off with 20% miserable, 20% committed, and 60% uh, you know, whatever. So it really comes down to that. And if you don't start looking at that, it doesn't matter how much effort and energy and, and effort you put in, it's not going to be as effective. So having the role of the leader is, is one really critical thing. Then that opens the door to things like, what is the mindset? I'm a big believer of growth mindset. I don't know if you've heard about it. Microsoft did their whole culture transformation based on it. Satna Nadella, his um, wife gave him a book, said, read this, it might help you at work. It's called Mindset by Dr. Carol Dweck. And they have completely transformed everything and all of their business metrics as well um, as, as part of it. And having that openness, and they talked about moving from a know-it-all to a learn-it-all culture. And having that mindset where people are open and curious, who want to try new things, is incredibly critical. But they're not going to do that without leadership. Which then goes to my third point. We've got to design things so people want to be able to use them. We had a situation at Heineken, we were doing quite a lot of digital transformations, we are moving around country by country. A year later, we went back and had a look at how well some of these finance processes have been put in place. And we did data mining, and we found in one particular process, there was 1,200 workarounds in that 12 months. <laughs> and I remember the person leading the program, and he said to me, people just need to be more disciplined. <laughs> that is not the answer. We need to design things and it makes it easy for people to, to use. We need to design things so it's hard and uncomfortable to do the workarounds. And we've got to bring that piece and understand the experience and that human-centered design element as well. So leadership, mindset, and design. Let's start with you. Obviously, our world has changed post-COVID and the way we work has changed. So what are the, um, the challenges that have come out of this post-COVID world uh, that are new to, to how we work and how we succeed? Yeah, the, it's, it's been interesting in the digital transformation landscape where suddenly the, the, the the people or the person to person contact was removed. Uh, and for a while there, the, we were dealing with each other solely over screens. And that changed things. And uh, the, the, 
the right of uh, success to Australia um, during that period of time with post COVID, I think um, anecdotally from what I've seen, has also reflected, has changed on the basis of there's been less people interaction. The, the only other things you've got to take into account as well in the, this new environment is literally the, the environments you people want to work in. Trying to get, so the, the, the age old rule, get the teams together early on. Um, get them working together around the table in the same room. It's bloody impossible to get anyone to come to the office, let alone to the same room. So incentivizing your people and, and incentivizing is such the, the right word because I'm so old school, I would like to tell. Now, the tell evidently is out the door. No one likes to tell. So how do then you incentivize the, the people to, to come in and then go to their work, to a, uh, someone else's work? space and uh, interact. And that's been the, the big change that I've noticed in, in particular. Uh, but it also has been is a critical success factor for, for me is getting people together early um, and getting them working together. I watched, um, uh, uh, there's another big project going on in New Zealand at the moment, I won't mention this name, um, uh, Sinlay, and um, but they, they announced in the paper. So they go out in the paper um, and say that part of their problem is SAP. Uh, and so for a vendor to name their partner, uh, well, that, that's huge. And But uh, digging into it, most of the relationships uh, in there are done via um, video calls because that's when the project started you know, on the back code. It wasn't anyone's fault. Sitting on its apps. Um, and... Uh, so they suffered because of a different landscape based on what was happening on the environmental factors. And uh, so for me, trying to work out ways of encouraging people to get together as uh, often as what you possibly can for people who just now love to be at home uh, is the, the most crucial success factor. Thank you, Eric. Um, Jeff, you've been involved in this for a um, do hit all areas of the business, but what are the key measures of success of any digital transformation? I had to write this one down to make sure that, that, I, that, I, that I had a few measures, which is why I've got the book here. So the, the, the first one is it's absolutely around adoption. So we talked a lot about, uh, about people and how important they are. So really find a, a before and after measure and make sure that uh, you're able to to, uh, to to measure those things and also drive things to 100% efficacy. A lot of us spend enormous amounts of money on technology and then think the job is done when it's introduced. That's that's hopeless, right? If the the, the aim is to drive those platforms to 100% efficacy, now you'll you'll never get there. But unless you've got metrics around that, especially around adoption, then you're you're really operating in the dark. Um, do a measure of structure change, right? You, you, if you think you're doing a technological transformation in your organization and there is no structure change involved, you're not transforming. So measure that. Um, reduction of handoffs. So, you know, that's that's one reason why, why Agile is, is so important to us at Galahad is we want the people who are closest to the customer or have the closest knowledge um, to make the insights that they need to do. If you have multiple handoffs, by the time you're at your fifth handoff, the request or whatever it is that started has lost all of its fidelity, 100%. So, you know, one, two handoffs, you're probably going to get the result that you want. If you've got five handoffs, you will absolutely not get what you need. So be, be able to measure that. Obviously, customer satisfaction, that, that one's a no-brainer. Um, also, your time too, the time to do things. Uh, part of it, you know, automation is not transformation, but it can be part of transformation. So you, you've really got to be reducing uh, the cycle times within your organization. Um, again, another obvious one, that the driving the bottom line. So there are a whole load of financial metrics that you can put in as part of that. And the last one I would say, back, back to people, is um, see if you can get a measure of critical thinking. You know, we talked about you know, growth mindset and all of those things are really important. Production line jobs are not going to be there. And when I talk about production line, I don't, I don't just mean on a, on a manufacturing um, thing. Anything that is 
that can follow a, a, a metronomic process that will be automated in the next five to 10 years. And we're all used to as professionals of providing answers. Well, you know what? In the future, technology will provide the answers. And what we need to be good at as individuals is asking the right questions. So that requires a complete retraining of your workforce. So if you can measure critical thinking in some way, then that again, that's a good measure of a, of a, a transformation that's actually worked. I'm sure there's more. Yeah. Russell, do you have any techniques you want to add as a success measure for digital transformations? Yeah, one key thing, and that is uh, the the measures of success, I don't think, have changed in the last 10 years, so, or even longer. The, the reason for doing a transformation is still the same reason as it was before, and that's you want to get better outcomes for your business. You want the business to grow, you want to take cash out, and the ROI, you want to innovate. Those reasons still remain the same. And other than the, the, the methodology of, you, of achieving those um, success factors and how you do it by different... Um, forms of IT that's come about, it's still the same. And so putting together what, uh, sorry, the initial goals of why you're doing this in the first place, um, and why you want to transform, why you want to, you know, the moving to the cloud isn't a reason to transform anything. It's to take out a lot of cash or be more productive or innovative. And I think that's a, a key thing is those same uh, success factors are still pertinent now. Thank you. So we'll move to the interactive Q&A session now. So if you'd like to submit any questions, then please use the QR code on your tables, QR code, um, and uh, bring those through. Okay, so first up, organisations' appetite for change is often greater than their capacity to implement it. How do you right size your transformation for your organisation? I'll, I'll have the first crack at this. If we get my microphone, my microphone's working again. Um, look, this is a cognitive bias we all have. We overestimate what we can do all the time. And without actually doing some really structured planning at the start and being realistic around what can be done, that's one of the reasons why I think so many change and transformations fail, because when you look at what, what the original intent is, it's not supported by the resources and the time and the effort required to actually do that. So being really pragmatic and actually recognising, we all have these lovely cognitive biases. We always think more positively when we plan things. So if you look at any of the data, we all plan terribly. And that is a key factor around that. So how do we bring that into it? But then also, how are we also enabling people to have the time to learn, to experiment, to try new things? Often with these, you know, we change something and we expect people to be just as productive immediately and we don't take into account the slowdown during the learning process and what that looks like. And that's one of the critical things as well too because often we find we're just not achieving what we said we were going to do because either it's too big we haven't planned it well, or we haven't actually allowed the time for people to, to learn and adjust as they go through that. Thank you, Martha. Um, another question here. How do we address the skill gap in the New Zealand market where we seem to have more leaders and management professionals than doers? I think ultimately the answer to that question is, is going to be technology. Having, having said that, technology isn't important, it just works. Um, <clears throat> The, so, again, in the next five years, we, we, we will find, especially for um, for larger organisations, they, they're going to have the funding to be able to put that cognitive AI layer over, over everything we do. So we struggle, especially in New Zealand, um, as, as we said there, in terms of you know getting uh, getting the right skills, and we often lament the fact that we yeah, we just can't get what we need. Well, if we encourage, as I've said earlier, that the, the critical thinking within our workforce, actually the technical skills that will be required uh, are, are actually going to be a lot less. So you have to ask um, through generative AI the right questions and then you're going to, you know, things will just be done. And, and if people say, oh, that's nonsense, that's, that's literally where we'll be in the next five years. Um, so we're, we're not there yet, but I think in terms of transformations, 
if you can make that generative AI element um, front and center of any transformation that you're planning from here on forwards, then I think that's the long term. I don't have, I have some answers in the short term, but they're, they're more satisfying than, than dealing with it permanently. But a couple of things I want to say as well too. I can get my mic working. Oh. Anyway, I'll talk and hopefully it will pick up. Um, so that point around, sorry, leaders and managers versus doers. I actually argue against that. I actually think our leaders and managers are often the doers as well, and they're actually not been spending the time leading and managing their people. And if you look at all the data out there, and there's a ton of data, and I like data, it's, it's great information. When you look at how leaders spend their time, their comfort zone tends to be in their technical speciality or functional speciality that they grow into, and that transition into leadership and management, they often stay more time doing the doing versus getting things done through their team. Another thing I'd say in New Zealand, and I notice this coming back from having worked in Europe, we see investing and in capability um, building as a cost versus an investment. And it's the when times are tough, what is the first thing we cut? Training budgets. And when you look at how easy it is to build capability, the technical stuff is a ton easier to build than all of the behavioural stuff. And it is, as going to back to Neville's point, technical stuff's going to be automated and, and sorted out through technology. Those behavioural aspects, those ways of thinking, that mindset, that is the challenging stuff that's harder to develop. We used to call it soft skills. Um, I don't really like that word, but that is the stuff that we know is harder to do, but actually is most important when you look at the future capabilities that's being identified in whatever you know piece of research out there. Okay, so we've talked about um, metrics of success for digital transformations, but Vernon, are there any other key metrics that you should be tracking as part of the transformation program as you go along? Yeah, the probably the one that's top of mind for me at the moment is around culture. Uh, and so with any transformation, particularly when organisations are coming together, it's measuring the, the mood of the nation as in the, the mood of the business and how the, the people are reacting to the change. Uh, sometimes it's um, uh, when you've got two organisations that are, are coming together that have been going for so long as such diverse cultures. And uh, so working out, well, what does our joint culture look like early on in talking about that and articulating that is really important rather than letting that um, self manifest until, until it becomes a thing on its own. I think it's important to address that early on. Okay, so our audience would like to know how our panel members navigated the local and usually smaller scale needs of a New Zealand business when you're a small component of a regional or global program? I do. <laughs> yeah, I'll, um, I'll just give it a go from my, my personal experiences. I um, worked for um, you know, a couple of pretty large businesses in the past in, uh, in, in Europe and Asia. Coming to New Zealand, you know, my, my first job in New Zealand was working for, for Les Mills International. Um, and that was, at the time, a, a, you know, a company of 103 people, and I'd left a company of 103,000 to come to New Zealand. I, I think the reality is there are some things that just need to get done. You know, something that we're quite allergic to in, um, in New Zealand business, because it can be, you know, good, good governance, because it's like, well, you know, what's the point? Let's just get on and do some stuff. It's like, what do you want to do? Don't care, just do something. Whereas deciding what, you know, what those things are that, 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 that is the long-term view, and then you can get on and do those things in the short term, I think that applies to any organisation. So the, the skill is actually taking um, global best practice and applying it locally. And uh, another example I would say is you know, ways of working. You don't have to be a, a, a company of um, you know, a, a thousand or 10,000 to be able to go agile. Agile is a mindset, right? There is there's a whole load of, of um, mechanics around it, but you can have you can have one squad in your organisation and still be agile. So there are those elements globally that we're doing so in terms of strategy, in terms of governance, in terms of ways of working, 
um, and indeed as technology has changed, it's lowered the entry point for using world-class technology. So you can make them New Zealand appropriate. So done really well in New Zealand. I'm sure my colleagues can think of lots more. Well, this one that comes to mind is sort of connected to the, the question, but governance is the, the part that, that raised it in my mind. And you, you'll find this hard to believe, but what I see is that Kiwis are typically too nice. And so what often happens is that when we form a relationship uh, between the, the vendor and the, the, the customer, people will like each other, and which is good. It's what we are hoping for. However, sometimes that means that when you get to governance meetings, the things, the hard things that need to be said don't get said straight away. And so when you've got a transformation project and you've got critical things that are happening, you want those things to be tabled first and be discussed and everybody on board with it. Uh, and I've noticed that sometimes that doesn't happen. Uh, they go through that, we're meeting, we're on target, we're on this, but what about the things that people are talking about that they're anxious about, that there's, you, you get people uh, stressed about, um, why don't we address that and get that on the table first? And it's that key governance structure of being able to uh, put the topics on the table of things that are hard that need to be addressed rather than um, put to one side, I think is important. Here, what are the continuous conversations we need to be having to ensure we're recognising the two tables of engaged people who are pulling everyone else along? So, sorry, can you just repeat that again? What are the continuous conversations we need to be having to ensure we're recognising the two tables of engaged people and who are pulling everyone else along? Or, sorry, and pulling everyone else along. Yeah, I mean, actually, so what's really interesting, the engaged people are also the ones most at risk of burnout because they're the ones that will put the extra effort in and do the extra work. So you've got what tends to happen is you have really highly committed engaged people who just work their butt off to be able to deliver and then, you know, they get sick, their family says, I haven't seen you in three months, Dad or Mum, whatever it is, and then they kind of crash and burn. So one of the key things to understand with the engaged people is actually making sure they're not carrying everyone else because they're often doing that at their own, you know, at, at, with an impact on themselves. But the key thing needs to be understanding how do we actually move that 60%. Um, the 20% are really tough. You know, at the end of the day, it's really hard to move someone from being really disengaged and hating their job to being back on board. But the 60%, at the end of the day, as human beings, we want to feel like we belong. We want to feel that we're valued, that we're doing purposeful work. It's actually not rocket science. And good leadership or good management is really getting clear what's expected of you, how are you doing, and how you can grow. And if you get that right, you've got that opportunity for this group of the 60 people, 60 percent of the people, um, which then, you know, the higher, and the thing is, this all the data now, we know for every percentage of an increase of engagement you have in your team, that your company makes more money, that it's more profitable, that you have twice as many people that apply for the jobs, you know, when you're advertising them. It makes good business sense. But we know 70 percent of what makes these two tables engaged is the manager. And the thing is, you look at the engagement stats, the data from Gallup, they reckon about um, two in seven leaders and managers have a natural affinity for leading and management. So they kind of almost intuitively know what to do. Another two, if they want to, can learn those skills. The other three probably should never have been given control of people. <laughs> and from an HR professional's perspective, that kind of, that sounds pretty right to me. That's awesome. Okay, I've got a popular question here. So given the opportunity, what would you do differently in your next business transformation? Um, I will I will um, just share a little bit. Is this where you can get this? Um, one of the things at Heineken, we had a massive digital transformation in our Europe region um, with SAP and moving everyone on a, on a combined thing instead of everyone being special and different and needing customization. Um, we focused on mindset way too late. So we didn't, we focused on the technology and the systems and all of that. And then when people were not getting on board, we then focused on mindset. So there's that key piece that I think 
you know, you want people to have that capability to be open to change, to embracing, willing to try new things. If you don't actually look at that as a foundational piece first, that would have made things a ton easier. Instead of now, there's still, and I'm still doing work with Heineken actually, and doing work around change capability, around growth mindset, because that's still a critical thing that's been identified as why things are not happening as, as easily or as quickly as they would like to be. I think for, for me, uh, it's not a massive change, but it's changing the order of things. So we, uh, we use a model um, for delivery in, um, in Gallagher called the, the Piccoli model. And, and there's four elements to that. There's the structure which I've talked about. There's people which are all of the socio sides of, of any transformation. And then there's technology and process. And as an IT person, you're sort of, you know, you, you're, you're on home to Papa or Mama and go, oh, yeah, I'm safe with, I'm safe with, uh, with technology and process and that's automation and I'm, I'm happy there. But actually, for me, um, if I was to have certainly that this current journey again, I would start obviously with strategy, but with structure, I would very rapidly then follow up with, with people. So having that cohort of, um, I'm encouraged digital natives, probably you know, the first cohort will come from these two tables, but we'll, we'll get to the rest um, you know, through the journey uh, and then be doing the left-hand side of the model um, because as, as we've said, that stuff just works. So changing the order of things would absolutely be something I would do differently. Well, this is going to be a little bit controversial being from the vendor side, but perhaps um, uh, adjusting the expectation of um, budget versus reality uh, for projects. And so the vendor's always going to try and sell you out of the box, or say out of the box all the time, but the project typically always creeps in scope for whatever reason. Projects generally go for, you know, a year, 18 months, new innovation comes along, new problems that need to be solved, uh, and so let's add that into the project, and that was never budgeted for in the first place. And then that leads to conflict because you have suddenly spending a lot more money than what was originally anticipated. And so, dare I say it, the planning to have uh, spend more than what you were thinking is probably um, useful. Sometimes, not the case of Gentry, but other organisations. <laughs> Just to wear a time here, so I have one last question. Um, as a technology leader, what is the one new skill that you would prioritise to learn for next year? Actually, getting really getting to grips with uh, with generative AI. You know, at, at the moment, you know, we're actually starting to use those um, technologies within our own organisation, actively encouraging it. Um, but but right now, the best I can do is you know a little bit of, of, of authoring of stuff, and then and then I've got to do a whole load of editing. Now that's that's my skills gap in terms of training um, uh, training the AI and, and asking the, the those right questions. So for me, actually, that's that's a technology skill that I, I really, even even as a fifty-two year old, I need to get into because it's such a it's going to be such a powerful augmentation to allow me to spend my time as leader asking the right questions and to stop giving answers because I've got something to give me answers, and, and I'm just scratching the surface at the moment with that particular technology. Okay. Melissa, is there a skill that you're prioritizing to learn? Um. I mean, oh, it's just working. Um, actually, I, I really like what Neville said because I'm, I'm using ChatGPT and all of that and I really feel like I've got so much to learn and I see the potential and it's going to be a tool. It's a bit like a hammer. You know, you can use a hammer to build a house or you can use a hammer to, you know, knock someone over the head. And I think the more we use these tools for good now is also going to help develop these and how they can be helpful in the future as well so we don't end up in Terminator. <laughs> Well, for, for me, it's more around um, climate change and learning more around what's happening in the, with the, the global climate. So I work in the utility sector and uh, right across the world, which is going through a massive period of, of change. And so I've had to, to, to try and play catch up. Uh, but really, we have the opportunity to make a massive influence on climate change with the, the use of innovation and technology that, that we're taking to market, particularly around being able to measure it. 
I really like that. And so learning more about that is absolute priority for me. However, I'm using chat GPT to learn. Thank you. Okay, so just so we are of time, it's, it's two o'clock, so I think we'll stop the Q&A, but our panelists will be hanging around for a little longer after. So if you've got any really burning questions, and sorry I didn't get through everybody's questions on the Slido, um, but please you know, hang around and, and have a chat with us. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity as well to let, what was it? Um, to let everybody know about our upcoming webinar, Embracing the Power of AI, very topical. Um, so we will send you an invitation out for this after this event. And uh, we will also be sending everybody a feedback survey. We'd just really like to hear how um, relevant you found the topic today and what we can do to make sure that we can continue to provide quality events. So that will come to your inbox. Uh, but thank you again for all of you for coming and a big thank you to our three panellists Melissa and Vernon for their fantastic contribution. So I think we've got this room till three, is that right? That's yes. right. And, um, yeah, there will be great stuff from the end, so feel free to you know, have as many drinks as you like. <laughs> 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you.